Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this early in the morning. My name is Jimmy. Uh, I'm part of the Chaos Group team. And uh, in this presentation, I intend to show you some of the cool features we have in V-Ray for Max. Uh, so my plan is to start with some of the other things uh, that are very useful, but for some reason people don't use or don't even know about. Uh, but it's going to be very short. I just have three quick things to show you. And I'm going to move on to the new things in V-Ray 2.0. So uh, let's begin. As you can see, I've already opened my first scene, and it's a very simple scene. Uh, usually when people work uh, and they work on their geometry, what they'll do is they'll keep their geometry in low poly so that uh, they can navigate easier and uh, they can work with it easier. They don't have to stress their graphics card. And then prior to rendering, what they'll do is they'll select all their geometry and they'll subdivide it. For example, they'll go and choose uh, some modifier to subdivide, subdivision mod modifier to subdivide the whole geometry into few triangles so that you get a smoother uh, meshes. Uh, the problem with this is that, uh, for example, if you use Turbo Smooth and then you subdivide this four times, you get much, much more polygons. And then in working with this becomes hard. And it also becomes uh, much harder to render all this uh, complex geometry because you have to keep it in the memory. Now, what you can do with V-Ray is uh, use the V-Ray Displacement modifier which uh, most of you probably know is uh, for creating displacement geometry, but you can use it in a different mode. So uh, what I have done here is uh, I have applied this uh, displacement modifier. And uh, let me just quickly render the low polygon uh, version of this thing. So you can see it's very uh, chubby. It's like uh, choppy, like edges and squares. You can see that it's a very low polygonal geometry. Now. Uh, when I enable this uh, displacement modifier, what uh, you see that is I have set the, the mode to subdivision, and I have also set the amount to zero, so that I'm not expanding this geometry in any direction. It's just uh, being subdivided during render time. And now when I hit render, you see that we will get this uh, smooth uh, geometry. The cool thing about this approach is that uh, V-Ray is treating this uh, geometry as displacement geometry, which is basically uh, what we call dynamic geometry. This means that uh, the new final geometry is only being generated while it's being rendered. So this way you're saving a lot of RAM uh, because only the buckets that are currently rendering parts of the geometry uh, have this detailed geometry. Everything else is kept out of the memory. And the way you can control the amount of subdivision is through the options that we get here. So as you can see, we have a bunch of options. We have uh, one that is called maximum subdivisions which basically specifies the maximum number of subdivisions. And then you have an edge le length parameter. Uh, now when I have set such a low value here, which is 0 0.01 pixels, this means that the longest edge, we will try to make the longest edge one t hundredth of a pixel long, which is not going to happen at any point. So that's why it's always reaching this maximum number of subdivisions. And it's actually subdividing my mesh four times. And if I set this to one, and render out this area here, you'll see that we get, well, this is not a good area to render. Here you'll see a bit better. You'll see that we get less subdivision here. Now, uh, this way I'm actually limiting the number of subdivision directly. And if I want to, I can uh, have an adaptive subdivision all over the whole mesh. So what I'm going to do is, for example, set a maximum subdivision of 10. And then I'll specify that I want the longest edge of this mesh to be 4 pixel long, pixels long. So uh, faces that are closer to me will be subdivided more times, and faces that are away from me will be subdivided less times. And in the end, I'll get a very smooth uh, geometry. Now, the one thing that should be kept in mind here is that uh, this, this is perfect for still images. But if you want uh, to make an animation and you want the camera to rotate around it, uh, you have to uncheck this view dependent and then actually specify in world units how many subdivisions you want, how long you want each edge. Because if you use it in camera view, when the camera rotates, the, the geometry will be subdivided differently for each frame. So you have to uncheck this view dependent, and then the whole mesh will be subdivided equally. And there will be no uh, difference in the geometry. OK, so as you can see, a very simple thing, but uh, it can save you a lot of memory, and uh, it can make your work a little bit easier. Another interesting here that I have here, 
is this setup is very simple. I have a plane with a very displacement modifier. If I render it out, you'll see that it's just an exterior scene. And uh, I'll enable the displacement. And I'm going to show you the map that I'm using. It is this map of a fence. And uh, obviously, I want to create and I want to turn this object into a fence. So uh, if I uh, click render right away, what you'll see that uh, we will display some of the geometry, but the parts where the black is it will have no displacement and we'll just be able to see the plane. Uh, but what I want to do is I want to create this kind of geometry with holes and everything. And the way to do this usually would be to use some sort of opacity map and map the, use this map, for example, to map the opacity channel of this uh, object. However, this uh, doesn't look too realistic and uh, there is a better way to do things. Okay, so uh, you can see that I have a very fine uh, geometry here and uh, let me just check my displacement modifier. So uh, if you take a look here, you'll see that uh, I have set my amount to 0 0.1 centimeters. So I'm extruding this one millimeter in front uh, to the front. And then I have this uh, checkbox that says water level and I have set it previously to 0 0.01 millimeters. So now when I hit render, what video will do it is it will create only the geometry that is between this 0 0.01 millimeter uh, centimeters and 0 0.1 centimeters. So all the geometry will be cut out and I will be actually able to create uh, this fine detailed uh, fence very, very easily. And it will also have a, some thickness, so it will not look flat as if it's uh, just a simple opacity map. And uh, you can see the result. And it's also uh, rendered pretty quickly and very memory efficiently because, once again, this is the displacement modifier. And uh, Vira is only keeping the geometry that is seen in the current buckets that are being rendered. Uh, I have another interesting example of the same thing. If you take a look at the scene, you see that we have two planes and I'm using uh, V-Ray uh, dome light to light up the whole thing. So now when I hit render, you see what I was able to do with those two planes. And to create these forks, I'm actually using the same approach. I have uh, a displacement map that has the shape of this fork, and uh, I'm using a water level to create the whole thing. So you can see, uh, of course, if I wanted to, I, can, I could have modeled those uh, forks, but it's much easier this way. And if you have a complex in that you want to add some detail, some small detail, you can only draw things in Photoshop, create some maps, and then uh, use the displacement. And you will see that they also have some small thickness of course, if I turn them around, I'll be able to see the uh, back faces of this uh, plane. But uh, what you can do is you can have two planes and then uh, displace them in uh, the opposite direction so that you can create geometry. OK, uh, last of the old features. And then we move to the new ones. Uh, I have this very complex scene. It's a ship that one of our artists modeled. Uh, to be honest, he's a little bit crazy. Uh, so you can see this is uh, a model of a ship, and this is in its uh, raw polygonal version before it's being actually uh, smoothed out. So you can see that it has 2.8 million polygons. And uh, if I zoom out, you'll see that it's very low polygonal. So if I want to render this out and have it a good smooth model, I'll have to subdivide the whole thing. And then uh, I'll have much more polygons, basically. So you can see that even at uh, 2.8, uh, my, uh, my graphics card is having troubles uh, rendering uh, my preview. And if I try to render it, it will be uh, hell. So fortunately, uh, we have a solution to that. Uh, as you know, Vira was developed a long time ago uh, when machines were only 32 bits and they could not even dream of rendering that amount of geometry. So what our developers back then created is a simple tool called the V-Ray proxy. And the very proxy actually allows me um, to save a complex geometry on my hard drive as a very mesh file and then load it into my hard, into my scene as this uh, sort of a preview that you see here from the very proxy. 
and then I can render the whole thing. Once again, this is going to be very memory efficient because V-Ray is only loading the parts of the geometry that are in the buckets. Uh, so in the end, you can uh, render this uh, huge model with uh, 1.2 gigabytes of memory. And uh, you have a bunch of controls to, to deal with that. If you, for example, if you, want, if you have four gigs or more on your machine of memory, what you can do is you can go to settings and specify exactly how much RAM you want V-Ray to use uh, for the whole uh, thing. You, you are actually setting up an upper limit that is never going to cross and it can become much faster this way. Another cool thing of the proxy as you can see is that uh, you see uh, this preview uh, which is not just a bounding box uh, it's rather uh, you can see the shape and it's much easier to orient it in, uh, in the, your scene. So uh, let me just show you a whole rendering of this thing. So you can see the amount of detail and uh, this was rendered uh, at our uh, office and this is uh, using the very edges texture to outline each of the faces that we have. So it's a very, very dense model. Okay, uh, so these were the old things that I wanted to show you. And now I'm going to move to the things that are new to V-Ray 2.0. Uh, as you probably know, uh, when you get V-Ray 2.0, you also get uh, V-Ray RT. And uh, the RT is our interactive renderer that uh, I have selected as my active shade renderer right now. And I'm going to run, in, run it on my CPUs now to set up the scene. Uh, as I told you, the VRT is a progressive path tracer, so it, uh, it become, begins rendering at a lower uh, quality and then constantly improves the quality by shooting more and more rays into the scene. And the main purpose of uh, this tool is to be able to uh, set up your lighting, your materials, um, your camera uh, view and so on. So uh, let's try and set up a shader. And this is something that a uh, lot of people ask me, how, how do you do this in V-Ray? So I'm going to show you now. Uh, what I want to do is I want to create a car paint material, uh, the old fashioned way for this, uh, for this uh, car here. So uh, I'm going to do now in front of you and see how the RT can help us uh, in that task. So what I need is a standard V-Ray material. And uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create the base layer because, as you know, uh, the car paint is actually a layered material. It has a base metallic paint, and then on top of it is a clear coat material. So I'll assign one very material to it, and I will start creating a metallic paint. Uh, if you want to create a metallic paint, what you need is uh, to have no diffuse whatsoever, and then you control the color uh, of the car by controlling uh, the reflection color. So let's say I want to create some sort of yellowish car. Right now it doesn't look like a paint because uh, this is uh, clear reflections and what we need to do is make them blurry. And I'll set something like 0.6 uh, for the reflection glossiness. Now it begins uh, to look much better but uh, in reality if you, if you do some research you'll see that the met metals uh, and metallic paints actually have Fresnel reflections. Uh, but the thing is that they have a very uh, high index of refraction. So for example something like 15. And uh, this is the view that you get. So it'll, the, the amount of reflections will depend on our viewpoint. Uh, now, this is uh, pretty nice, but uh, let's try and create a little bit more interesting materials. So I'm going to set them up here and pick a follow of map. And uh, this is one paint that I like to create. I'll mix red with purple. And uh, yeah. You can see the result, it looks pretty nice. Uh, I can choose between perpendicular uh, parallel or Fresnel. Both of them uh, look okay, but I prefer the first one because you can see how the paint changes based on our direction that we're looking at. Okay, so this is my base paint and uh, let's now try and create the clear coat that is going to go on top of it. Once again, I'm going to use a uh, very material. I'm going to drag it on my car and uh, this time uh, the clear coat material again has no diffuse and it is very very reflective and uh, basically it has just a little bit of uh, blurriness so that I get some speculars in the end. 
and this is going to be my clear coat materials. Now to blend those together, uh, I'm going to use the V-Ray blend material. And as you know, the blend material allows us to combine up to 10 different materials on top of each other uh, and uh, blend them using colors or uh, textures. So what I did is I put my base material as the base material and then the clear coat on top of it. And uh, you can see the result. It looks pretty nice, but um, the blending is very straightforward, just a simple color here. So if I move it, I'll be able to see different parts of the material. Uh, but actually, I want to use, uh, once again, a fall of texture to blend those two materials. So I'm going to pick a fall off, and this time I'm going to use the Freno mode. And uh, to adjust the amount of reflections here, I'm going to use the index of reflection and set it to 2.2. So, uh, this is my car paint. Uh, I'm going to zoom out and give it a few seconds. As you can see, um, it's very easy to create it and with the RT, you get the feedback immediately. So, uh, even if you don't know exactly what you're doing, uh, you can at least see the result uh, straight away. However, uh, in Vira 2.0, there is an easier way to create car paint materials. And uh, I'm going to show it to you uh, right away. So I'm going to pick a new slot, and you'll see that we have this V-Ray car paint material. So we have a predefined material that allows us to set up the same layer shader, but with one little addition is that we have these uh, flakes uh, in the car paint. So as you know, most, most metallic paints have some uh, metallic flakes in them, and you'll be able to see them over here, over here. They're too big right now, but uh, I'm going to fix that. Uh, let me just give it a very bright different color so you can see them better on the monitor. You see those are uh, the metallic flakes. Once again we have three layers. We have a base layer, we have the coat layer, and in the middle we have the flakes layer. So to set it up quickly I'm just going to go from, uh, bottom to the, from the bottom layer to the top layers and I'm very quickly going to disable the two top layers. Now the base layer is uh, very simple. Once again, we have uh, a color, and uh, this uh, layer automatically mixes diffuse with uh, reflections for us. So we have this uh, reflection parameter, which if I set to zero, I only see the diffuse part, and if I set to one, I only see the reflections part. And uh, I have the, the glossiness, the reflection of the glossiness, which I can control with the lower parameter. So it's uh, just a few things allow me to set up the material the way I want it. I want you to see more reflection. And let me make this this color. Of course, this can be mapped, but uh, for the time being, I'm not going to do that. And then on top of this uh, material, I have the flakes. So as you know, as you see, so I uh, check this, uh, set this parameter to zero, which is the flakes density. So if, in, if I increase it back to four, for example, you'll be able to see a lot of flakes on my uh, car. And in the moment, they're too big. And one of the reasons for this is that uh, I'm using uh, this explicit UVW mapping. This is a texture, actually. And I don't have UVWs for this car. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to tri planar mapping from object XYZ. And this will make things a little bit better. So you can see now I have a lot of very, very fine flakes. And if I want to, I can actually increase the scale just a little bit so that uh, they're more visible. Okay, and then I'm going to give them a color that is close to the color of the paint. And uh, okay, obviously I have too, too many flakes because they're changing the color of the whole thing. But as a whole, you can see that it's uh, very, very straightforward setting this up. And if we give a few minutes to the V-Ray RT, it's going to clear out the whole thing. Now, an important thing to know about the flakes is that uh, it, there are this uh, very complex uh, map that we're creating and it takes some memory. So uh, if you want to limit the memory that th this uh, map is using, you have this uh, ma flakes map size that you can set into pixels. And you can also change the different types of filtering. So uh, you have a simple filtering, which is uh, so faster and creates a little bit noisier results, and the directional uh, filtering, which creates better results, but it's a little bit slower. In the end, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put on the uh, coat layer, and uh, once again, I can decrease its no uh, grossness just a little bit to make it uh, so that I have some speculars in my 
coat. And there we have it, the very car paint material. And if we give it a couple of minutes, of course, it will clear things out. Uh, but I suggest that we uh, move on to the next scene. Okay. Next on the list, uh, how many of you have uh, ever tried to render uh, an interior scene uh, with light cache? Uh, okay, most of you basically. So uh, what happens often is that um, sometimes you get those light leaks in the light cache that you have to play around with the light cache and with the sample size to fix. And uh, in here what I have is a simple scene that uh, I have created which is created in such a way that those light leaks appear uh, on purpose. So I have this very thin wall then I have this spotlight on the other side. And the other thing that is interesting is that this object here has um, a reflective material, which uh, is, is glossy reflections. And I also, in my light cache, I have enabled the check box that says, use light cache for glossy rays. So uh, I'm going to switch to my camera and render out. And you'll see a bunch of uh, problems that appear uh, if you set up your scene like this. So you can see it even in the radiance, you can see that we get some white leaks here that don't look too good. Okay, uh, I'm going to set up my history here for V-Ray. So, uh, as you can see, we get the light leaks and also the glossy reflections here are terrible. We get those splotches there. So I'm going to save this. And uh, what we did in V-Ray 2.0 is so we introduced a simple uh, option that says retrace threshold. And what it does, it actually detects uh, places where this these problems will appear. Uh, and then in a certain radius, it uses the primary engine, whatever primary engine you have set up to trace the GI in those areas. So uh, it will fix all those light leaks and it will also fix the glossy reflections here. So let's render it out. you see that the, uh, the white leaks are gone and the reflections look much better. What I can actually do is I can uh, save this as well. And I can use this new features, feature of the V-Ray FFB to be able to see the difference very, very easily. So just a simple checkbox that fixes a bunch of problems. OK, uh, next on the list. Uh, I have this uh, simple scene. I'm trying to simulate uh, the, the bottom of a lake or a river. And uh, if I zoom out, you'll see I have a very physical camera, a very sun over there. And I have uh, two objects uh, that are one is the, the, the bottom, and then I have another object on top of it. So if I look through my camera render out, I also have caustics enabled, of course. Uh, we'll be able to see uh, the result. Hey, so this is uh, the look I'm going for, these uh, nice caustics that appear here. But just by looking at this, uh, I somehow know that this doesn't look too realistic. And the reason for this is that uh, the human mind knows that uh, when light is refracted, it's also dispersed. So I should be able to see some uh, colors here. And uh, in V-Ray 2.0, we updated the standard V-Ray material. So if I go to the refraction part, you'll see that I have this checkbox that says dispersion. I'm going to enable it and hit render again. And as this is rendering, you'll see that next to the dispersion, I have this uh, parameter that says Abi, which is actually allows me to control the strength of the dispersion. And uh, what you should know that it works in the inverse manner. As I increase the Abi, I'm uh, decreasing the dispersion effect. And as I decrease it, I'm increasing the dispersion effect. So it's uh, inverse connection there. And you can see that we get some uh, nice colors here. Uh, so this looks much more realistic, and it's a simple thing, but it will make your renders, especially if you have, uh, if you have to render uh, some scene with many refractive objects, this things will look much uh, more realistic this way. Now I have uh, 
simple scene here, or an animation basically, that I want to show you. So this is what the, the kind of animations that you can create this way. And now this is, uh, if you're going for something that looks realistic or physically based, this is perfect. But actually you can use uh, the same approach for uh, more creative um, things. So uh, maybe you recognize this scene. I'm a fan of a certain band. Uh, so we have, let me just examine the scene. Uh, what I have is this direct light. I have two cameras. I have this object which is uh, refractive and it uh, has this V-ray material with the dispersion enabled. And uh, I also have uh, this gizmo, which is actually holding a V-ray environment fog. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to create volumetric caustics inside of this V-ray environment fog. And I also have a V-ray tune environment to just uh, see the edges of, uh, of my refractive object here. So if I take a look through this camera and render out, you'll be able to see uh, the kind of images we can create. <laughs> so this is real uh, ray traced volumetric caustics with dispersion and it's rendered that fast. <laughs> and uh, as you saw, there was a camera that was called animation. So. Uh, I actually have the animation here and I'm going to show it to you right now. And uh, this was rendered at around uh, 18 or 19 seconds per frame at one of our machines back home. So it's very well optimized for rendering as well. Okay, uh, next. Ah, I have this very simple scene and uh, I want you to know if someone can tell me how I did this. How am I doing this that I'm displacing the two, uh, the, the, this uh, plane based on its proximity to, the, to this object. Does anybody know how we can do this? Well, uh, most people think that uh, this is the very dirt map because you know the very dirt map is actually able to give you black color, for example, when objects are close together and white color when they're far away. But uh, this is not the case because the dirt map requires ray tracing and it cannot be used to create something like displacement. Uh, what I'm using right now is a new texture that we added. It's called a very distance texture. So I'm using it to displace this uh, plane here. And the distance texture again brings back two colors, black or and white, based on the proximity of objects. But you have to specify which objects uh, you want to have the proximity measure to. So uh, it, you can use this to create um, dynamic geometry like displacement, like V-ray fur. And I'll show you one example of this uh, in this scene here. So I have the V-ray displacement modifier. I also have the V-ray fur. And as you can see, when I'm moving this object, the V-ray fur is moving with it. It's growing. So I'm controlling the length of the fur with this uh, texture. So uh, if it was a single shot, of course, I can create my map manually. But uh, in case of animations or anything like this, it's a good idea to have procedural texture for this. So uh, one simple scenario that this may be very useful is, for example, I'm having a character that's walking through a grass field, and you want the character's legs to be actually uh, deforming the grass. Using these textures will do that for you very easily, and you don't have to create so many maps for each frame. And also in an interior scene, if you have a very thick carpet and you want to put objects on the carpet, you can make the objects deform the carpet strands. So I'm going to give it a few seconds to render and uh, you'll see the result. So it's quite visible that we have the grass next to this object and also the displacement is here. Uh, I'm not going to wait for the whole thing to render. Okay, uh, next on the list is a simple tool, so don't be intimidated by this complex scene. Uh, I'm going to render it out right now. Okay, uh, how many of you have to ever deal with uh, matching real footage with CG? Do you do that ever? Okay, so one of the main problems when you want to put a real object in CG uh, footage or whatever, the other way around, uh, is that you need to match the cameras. You need to match the, the, the angle of view, everything, the, the, the shutter speed, the, 
the exposure and so on. And the hardest thing to match is the um, distortion. So each camera has its own unique distortion. Uh, and uh, until now, the only way to uh, match the camera distortion was to uh, use one of the mathematically de described distortions that V-Ray has. So you could switch to cubic or quadratic or whatever. Now in V-Ray 2.0, uh, we created a new tool that is called the V-Ray um, Lens Analysis Tool. And I'm going to show you how you can use this. So this is what the tool looks like. It actually allows you to uh, create a distortion map for your own camera. And the way we do this is uh, you go to Analysis, Print, Test, Chart. It's going to allow you to select uh, the aspect ratio of your camera. So you can print out a, a picture that looks like this. So you're going to print this out, uh, put it on the wall. Uh, you're going to write it uh, good. There is on our website. There is a good description of how you should write uh, the, the thing, and uh, then you're going to take a bunch of pictures of it that look like this. And if your camera has uh, a lens with different focal length, you can take different uh, pictures for each uh, focal length. So in the end, when you have those pictures, you're going to add them to the tool, and you're going to uh, let the tool analyze them. So then get some information about the distortion. The final, it's a good idea to have a few pictures for each focal length. So in the end, uh, you can create a better uh, profile. So I'm going to say consolidate profile, and then I'm going to save this profile on my desktop. Now what I can do is uh, I can select my physical camera and pick a lens file that I just created. So now if I render, you see that uh, there is some distortion, and this is a distortion of one of my Codex cameras uh, back in the office. So a simple thing, but it will make it much easier to match uh, your real footage with uh, CG footage, and uh, it will look natural. OK, another cool thing that I have here, uh, if you take a look at the scene, uh, you'll see that I have uh, some grapes and uh, two pears, and it's uh, the all, all the pairs have the same, the two pairs have the same material and all the grapes have the same material. Uh, but if I render out, you'll see that they look differently. Uh, even in the right case, you'll see that some of those are blue, those are green, uh, those are red or purple or what's that, pink. So uh, let's see how, how we created that. Uh, I'll wait just for a couple of seconds for it to, to render and Basically, what we did in V-Ray 2.0 is we created a new texture. It's called V-Ray Multi Subtext, and it works much the same way like the, uh, like the Multi Sub material. What it does is that it allows you to have one and the same material on different objects, but based on uh, the object's IDs, you can feed those materials different textures or different colors. And uh, I'll show you the setup of the two materials so it will get uh, much more clear. So let's just render some of the grapes here and I'll stop it because it's rendering too slow. Okay, so you can see we get uh, purple grapes, green grapes, this pair is uh, orange or yellow and this one is green and we got some pink ones down here. Okay, so I'm going to stop this and uh, open my material editor. And let's first examine the material for the grapes. As you can see, it's a very complex material. I'm using a very blend material. Uh, my, my base material is this uh, subsurface material. And I'm adding some dirt and some reflections on top of it. But the important thing is in here. So uh, if I expand this, you'll see that uh, for SSS color, I'm using a texture, which is this uh, the texture that I told you about, called very multi subtext. And if we check the parameters of the textures, you'll see that we have different IDs. And for each ID, I have set a different color here, a small variation in the color. Actually, I have 12 different uh, colored grapes in my scene. So uh, if I select this and uh, just pick one grape, you'll see that this one has an ID of 6, and this one has an ID of 5. And so that's how I'm adding the, the little variation. And the same thing goes for the uh, pairs. Once again, but this time the difference is, uh, once again, I have the same material, but uh, instead of using color, I have attached textures. So one of the, the pairs has this texture, and the other one has this one. And uh, I'm also using not uh, face IDs, but object IDs. So uh, 
if we check out this pair here you see that this one has an object ID of 2 and the other one uh, has an object ID of 1 so this is a very simple uh, texture but it can make it much easier for you to arrange your scenes and also if you want to, to have different objects that have uh, basically the same materials but with small variation you can do that uh, very very easily uh, next thing I have this interior scene and uh, it is created in such a way just to demonstrate uh, one idea so uh, this scene has many many lights in it and tracing many area shadows is very difficult because you need to trace lots of rays so it's basically slow now for the purposes of this demonstration I have uh, already saved my global illumination so that's why we're rendering so quickly uh, but uh, if I want to do this uh, the right way and I want to be able to adjust the different light intensity and the, the light colors I would have to generate the GI every time so uh, every time I change something in the in the lights I'll have to render for a long time and setting up the final look of the image uh, is very difficult because what you need to do is set up the lighting so uh, what we did is uh, in Vray 2.0 we created a new render element called uh, the Vray light select and this render element actually allows me to extract the contribution of each light or a group of lights to a separate render element and then I can uh, get those render elements and compose them back together uh, in any compositing software so you can see these are uh, different parts of my uh, rendering that I'm going to compose and then in compositing I can fine-tune the lighting very quickly and I don't have to pre-render everything every time so let's wait for it to finish and I'll show you okay so uh, just let me show the render settings here you can see we have very light select code low, low lights and uh, I have all those small lights here in it and then I have uh, front window one light top top thin lights just one light and so on so uh, I have all those render elements over here and uh, if I click the button uh, button it will uh, open PD player so I can compose those layers back together I'm just going to use the add operator and I'm going to make sure that I'm ignoring the alpha channel and uh, you can see the two images look basically the same but now I can select each of those render elements and uh, adjust the lighting on the right uh, image very quickly and uh, let's play with it a little bit mm, for example this small light I'm going to play with now so I can turn it up and turn it down and you can see it's affecting the final image the cool thing is that when I select these low lights I can increase their intensity you can see it's also affecting this area here and I can also change their color very easily so I can fine-tune my lighting not in uh, rendering not during rendering but uh, in post-production so this will save me a lot of time uh, finally I have a nasty scene to render so this is an interior scene uh, it has one very bright light source then everything else is dark and I have uh, lots of glossy reflections and refractions uh, only reflections and I have also depth of field so uh, this is basically how to render and uh, as you know uh, nowadays it seems that everything is supposed to be in stereoscopy so you have to if I want to create it, this image in stereoscopic uh, mode I need to render it twice and if I had an animation I would have to render for a long long time uh, so uh, if I switch to stereoscopic mode, I have this uh, stereoscopic rig that is going to uh, render the two images immediately. Uh, Vray is smart enough and it's going to use some things like the GI. For example, it will use just the first light cache and just the irradiance map that it created. It's not going to create one light cache for each of the two eyes. Uh, but for everything else, uh, it's not going to be that well optimized. So. Uh, what we did is uh, we introduced uh, some small, some kind of new optimization called the Vray Shade Map, and it actually allows me to create a shade map, which is a map of the sh all the shaded points in this scene that I can later use um, to create depth of field, motion blur, uh, and stereoscopic images much much faster. So I'm going to show you how this works straight away. I just want to render this out so that we can compare the speeds.
Okay, so this took one minute and 50 seconds almost to render, one minute and 49 seconds. Uh, so I'm going to turn this off and uh, here in uh, the helpers I'm going to create the V-Ray stereoscopic rig. Bring it out, it's just a dummy, it's not going to be rendered. And you see that we have some options called shade map here. So I'm going to say that I want to render a shade map and uh, specify where I want it to be saved and hit render. Now V-Ray is going to create just the shade map so it will disable all the hard thing to render and uh, it will just create a crisp uh, rendering of, uh, of my scene. Okay, so now my shade map is created. It took me 1 minute and 15 seconds to do that. And uh, now I'm going to pick my uh, stereoscope, V-Ray stereoscopic helper and uh, turn to use shade maps. And now I'm also going to uh, use the stereoscopic uh, helper to create this uh, stereoscopic image. So it's going to render out two images, one for the left eye and one for the right eye. So you can see it's rendering uh, much faster now. And it also has the depth of field and everything enabled. And uh, this is an optimization that you'll see uh, works great for stereoscopic images, but it also works great just if you have a scene with very heavy depth of field effect. This uh, way you can render this depth of field much, much faster. Uh, right now, as you see, I need to go through, through, steps, to, through two steps manually. Uh, but uh, in the future, we're planning to update this so that uh, you just check it that you want to use the shade map functionality and it will do the both steps for you automatically. And this one was rendered in 40 seconds. So the first one was rendered in 1 minute and 50 seconds and now I rendered left and right eye all together in 1 minute and in 2 minutes basically. B uh, 5 seconds less. So uh, it's a great optimization and um, especially in animation it's going to be very useful. And what else we're going to do in the next, uh, uh, when we update this, uh, is that uh, right now, if you want to use it for animations, you need to create a shade map for each frame. Uh, but uh, what we intend to do is uh, we intend to be able to make it so that with one shade map, you can render uh, a whole animation where you have just the focus length or just the amount of depth field changing. And you see just the same area of the, of the scene. Okay, uh, so that's pretty much everything I wanted to tell you. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer those. No questions? Okay, uh, I'm here all day, so you can ask me later if you uh, think of anything. Uh, thank you for your time.